And uh, I want to thank Andres for organizing this uh, wonderful event uh, through the Canada Columbia Chambers. And uh, we're going to get started. Andres is going to present uh, the event and uh, present the ambassador. And then we'll jump into a very interesting panel discussion with uh, some folks that have some really great experience uh, doing business in, in Colombia from Canada. So I'll pass it over to Andres to kick us off. Thank you. All right. So, <clears throat> well, thank you very much. And um, thank you for hosting this event. I also want to say uh, congratulations. Uh, this uh, weekend, Paul is going to get married, so congratulations on that. Okay, so well, thank you all for coming, and uh, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I'm very excited to have the, the ambassador with us, to have the, uh, such a great panel, and uh, obviously have you all. Uh, I see some familiar faces, but I'm very happy when I see new faces that I can see that new people are coming to Colombia, so thank you all for coming. Um, so we're going to start with the ambassador speaking about uh, very generally uh, about Colombia, uh, new industries or what's going on in Colombia, and trying to close with um, more details about the orange economy and the innovation in Colombia. Then we're going to have a panel with the experts from different sectors, ranging from uh, architectural design to uh, blockchain and uh, animation. So uh, looking forward to that speech as well. Uh, I'm going to introduce myself, but before that, I'm going to thank our sponsors, Export Developing Canada and also Government Affairs Canada. Thank you for your support. So my name is Andres Trivino, President of the Canada Columbia Chamber of Investment and Trade. We are an independent organization created in Canada to promote business relations between Canada and Colombia. We had plus 50 events uh, since we started the Chamber. Uh, this is one of the first, uh, or the first event that we do in the creative industries. Uh, we're very keen on that, and we're going to support that during this year and going forward. Uh, I'm going to introduce His Excellency Federico Ojo Salazar, Ambassador of Colombia to Canada. His Excellency Federico Ojo Salazar serves as Ambassador of Colombia to Canada since December 2018. Prior to his appointment, he was elected to Congress as a House Representative for Antioquia and was a member of the Second Constitutional Commission in charge of security and defense, foreign affairs, and foreign trade. He was a lecturer of reputable universities in Colombia, such as Pontificia Bolivariana and the AFIT, and where he taught courses in public opinion and development. He was also an opinion columnist at El Colombiano newspaper. He was a, oh, he's a graduated, um, uh, he was graduated from the political science and a master's degree in government and public policy of the AFIT University, and also has an advanced political studies from the University of Notre Dame and Phoenix Institute. Excellent. He has been recognized with the Order of Merit General Jose Maria Cordova in the degree of Grand Officer and also has the Medal of Centennial Distinguished Services, Simona Duque de Alzate Commendatory Category. So congratulations, Ambassador. Without further delay, please help me in welcoming Ambassador Federico. Thank you. Well, good morning to everyone. My name is Federico. Don't call me Your Excellency. I don't like that. Um, Andres, you, you made me wear a tie for this event during the beautiful Canadian summer. So, yeah. So most of you are not wearing one, so good for you. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you for, for, for this marvelous event, Andres. It's um, my pleasure and honor to speak about my country, investment opportunities in, uh, with this very uh, select audience. Thank you for that, and I'll go straight to the uh, message. Uh, this photo, I think, is pretty cool to start the, the the presentation because it's President Duque in his latest visit to Silicon Valley uh, with a group of more than 100 entrepreneurs, Colombian entrepreneurs, where they were looking for business. Uh, and I think it says a lot, not only about our government's approach towards new businesses, but uh, also about our country. Colombia is nowadays a country who uh, have a population that seven out of 10 Colombians are less than 40 years old. That might explain why I am ambassador to Canada. Uh, it's a young, vibrant country who's looking into the fourth industrial revolution and our uh, government has deeply understood that and are focused on promoting the fourth industrial revolution industries. Three main pillars, equity, legality, and entrepreneurship. I'm going to speak uh, very briefly from in, in detail, but I would like to start with equity, with legality which is a major principle. And when we speak about legality, we not only wish to bring legality to most 
of the corners of Colombia, but also to the region. And Venezuela is a very, very big focus to us. We believe the stability of Venezuela is the stability of Latin America and the stability of Colombia. And if Venezuela regains democracy, Colombia is going to grow economically, but also the region is going to do so as well. But more than that, it's a matter of human rights, respect of the rule of law and of the human person. So Venezuela is one of our main focuses, and we're very confident that we're doing important, taking important steps towards the uh, building of democracy in Venezuela once again. Let me speak briefly about some uh, macroeconomic uh, data. Uh, I know that PowerPoint and Excel and spreadsheets uh, can say a lot or very few, but I'm going to go briefly through each one of them. Our economic growth is something that our economic reactivation is something that's going on in Colombia. We're confident that we're, we're taking uh, the right uh, decisions. Uh, we're going to uh, be one year in government and uh, we are already seeing the results. Uh, in our tax reform last year, we had a significant lower of uh, uh, taxes for corporations, for uh, companies, and I think we're starting to, to know that. Mining and energy are one of the uh, sectors that are growing the most in Colombian economy right now. Consumer spending is going up as well. Consumer confidence is uh, gaining momentum as well. The industrial out output is also feeling the uh, effects of recovery. Uh, our industries are getting more stronger, and I think this is a direct uh, consequence of the lowering of the income tax and corporate tax for, for companies in our last tax reform. And this is a little bit of Colombia compared to the region, to Latin America. We are the fourth largest economy in Latin America, the 32nd largest in the world. And uh, compared to some of our, of our neighbors, we're not going to speak about other countries, we're just going to speak about Colombia. Uh, I think we're growing, we're doing good, and we have an ascending momentum in our economy. Uh, economic perspective, according to the World Bank, we have a, a perspective of growth of 3.4% for 2019. Uh, we believe this uh, uh, goal is going to be accomplished. Nonetheless, our goal as a government is to make the Colombian economy grow by 4.5% each year, hopefully starting next year with this economic momentum, uh, if it keeps this way. For indirect investment, we had up and ups and downs. Uh, again, uh, as a product of, of not only of our tax reform, but our message in the uh, orange economy, as we're going to speak more in depth a little bit uh, further ahead. Uh, foreign direct investment is growing in Colombia. The message of uh, the reactivating of the mining industry is also being uh, felt by, 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 by the numbers, by the industry. And uh, of course, the geopolitical situation. While as many of our neighbors are having complex uh, political situations with populism, Colombia has been stable and has been a stable economy, but also a responsible uh, fiscal man management for many years. And I think the region is starting to note that as well. Some of the Canadian investment in Colombia, I, think, I thought it was a cool picture as well, but I have to say that uh, investment is done by pri private companies, not by the government. Nonetheless, this is a cool photo. I was there. That was in September in New York during the General Assembly. Uh, there is also a keen interest and appetite for Canadian companies in Colombia and the investment is growing. Of course, 2016 was a special year since, since Brookfield bought Isahen, one of our major uh, uh, public services and the electric companies that brought uh, the investment numbers up. But more than that, we think that uh, there's a keen interest in Colombia by Canadian companies. And let me speak briefly about some investment opportunities. Why this photo? This was the inauguration of one of the centers for the world for the fourth industrial revolution in Medellin, my hometown. Uh, this is uh, owned by the World Economic Forum and Colombia uh, won the, the prize as, a, as the country where the World Economic Forum was opening one of these fourth industrial revolution centers, which is focused on artificial intelligence, Blockchain and, blockchain and IoT. 
This was uh, inaugurated in Medellin a couple of months ago with the presence of the mayor of Medellin, President Duque, and our Minister of Foreign uh, of, of, of uh, Commerce and Trade. And I think it also set, tells a, a message about, about the region and about how the world is looking in, in, into Colombia as a place of uh, potential 4.0 industries uh, growth. I know we're going to speak about the orange economy in depth today with, with some of our panelists. Let me just say something briefly. Um, the orange economy is everything that has to be related with the creative industries, with the arts, literature, technology, uh, movies, programming, everything that has to do with ideas, which is an uh, infinite source of, resource, uh, 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 source of, uh, of resources, uh, is the orange economy. President Duque worked with the Orange Economy during 12 years at the International Development Bank, and he created a strategy for the whole region. And now that he's present, he has a transversal, transversal strategy that goes through each one of our ministries, and we're focused on that. So the Orange Economy, the creative industries uh, sector, represented more growth and uh, GDP uh, presence than coffee and mining together. Colombia is a land of creativity, Colombia is a land of talent, and it's not only rhetoric, but the numbers back this statement. And the, eco the orange economy sector is creating almost a million jobs in Colombia. Our goal is to achieve 6% of the GDP by 2020 with the investment in this new sector of the economy and some tax incentives for the orange economy companies that will go into Colombia and that will invest in Colombia. Seven year tax, uh, income tax exemption, uh, VAT exemption of the, on the importation, production or purchase or fixed assets, access to credit with uh, favorable conditions and soft landing. This is Ruta N, this is in Medellin. This is our biggest innovation and technology center. The fourth industrial revolution center is established in this place we also offer soft landing for companies that wish to uh, go to Medellin and to invest in Colombia. And let me say something about the Orange Economy Bonds. This was, a, this was a very innovative approach of President Duque. He created the Orange Economy Bonds. And our initial offering was for 400,000 million pesos. Nonetheless, the demand uh, doubled the expectations. There were bids for more than 832,000 million pesos on the public offering in November last year. This also shows the appetite of the world in investing in the orange economy and is seeing the potential Colombia has as an orange economy hub of the region and of the world, I would also say. Now let me, let me speak about something from my heart, which I truly believe in, which is uh, renewable energies. <clears throat> this is our Minister of Mines and Energy, Ms. Maria Fernanda. And this is our Minister of Environment, Mr. Ricardo Lozano. So these are the power guys in the house for the renewables in Colombia. Let me tell you a little bit about our energy matrix in Colombia. We have a very clean, sustainable economic matrix. 71% of our energy matrix is hydro. We have lots and lots of water, not as much as you guys in Canada, but we have good water in Colombia and most of our energy matrix is hydraulic. It's clean. Uh, nonetheless, as you very well know, it's unstable. So we need bigger stability due to uh, climate change phenomena such as El Niño and La Niña, for instance. Colombia has the sixth uh, most clean energy matrix in the world, and this is how we are right now. And this is interesting. Uh, Colombia only contributes 0.4 of the global emissions of CO2. So you could say that Colombia is a fairly uh, a green, uh, responsible country, in the world stage uh, and doesn't pollute a lot. Nonetheless, it's one of the 20 most vulnerable countries for climate change in the world. So climate change directly affects us and it has to be a priority to us. Colombia signed the uh, Paris Agreement. We are fulfilling the, uh, our, our commitments to the Paris Agreement. I had the honor of being the uh, Congressman who presented the Paris Agreement to the rest of the Congress, and we had an, a unanimous vote in Colombia. Even though of our difference, political difference between the left, the right, liberals, uh, conservatives, uh, Green Party, there was a unanimous vote 
towards the signing of the Paris Agreement in Colombia. And I think it also says a lot about our spirit as a country and our concern in climate change and the necessity of renewable energies. There is political confidence and stability in this sector. That's a message I would like you to keep this day. And let me speak about our goals for by the end of our, our, our government, hopefully. This is the way we are right now. 70% hydro, 21% hydro, 29% uh, uh, coal and thermic energies. Um, solar and eolic add up only 6% that they're, they're not fully established yet. This is just the adjudication of projects. So these were the projects that were given in the last, in the last, in the last bid. Uh, this would add up 6%, but our goal is to have 10% of uh, renewables uh, by the end of our term. That would mean 10 times more than what we have right now. And we're open for business in these regards. Um, our public offering for renewables is going to be the next semester, hopefully the next month. Our minister and President Duque has have very clearly stated that they want Canadian companies participating in our uh, public offering in this next semester because of your expertise, because of uh, the way Canada is concerned about climate change and the technologies and capacities you have developed. So we want Canadian companies investing and participating in the renewable energies bid next year. And let's go to tourism, which in President Duque's words is our new oil. This is a beautiful uh, photo of the park of Chiribiquete. This is one of uh, the most important uh, nature parks in Colombia. This was sort of a park that was rediscovered after the peace process was signed because no one could go there due to insecurity and violence. And now it's one of uh, the crown jewels in Colombia. So this is our new oil, we think, uh, tourism in Colombia. Good news for those of you who didn't know. It was one of our first accomplishments here at the embassy. Uh, it was to take off the uh, reciprocity fee for Canadians who were entering into Colombia. This was a unilateral sign of goodwill by our government because we believe in tourism. We believe in business. We believe in, in private companies. We want to grow as a nation. We want to be closer to Canada. So this was something that, yeah, it was giving lots of millions of dollars in, in tax to Colombia. Nonetheless, we said, it needs to go because we want more tourism and more Canadian investment in Colombia. So, yeah, you had a special line. It was very comfortable for many of you who were going in the country. You might have to do a longer line now, but you don't, you're not going to have to pay any uh, tax to go into our country. And this started to operate by May the 1st this year. It was a small victory and a fast victory had here during our, our, our office uh, in the Colombian embassy here in, in Canada. Uh, a little bit about Colombian tourism, this, it's growing. It grew by 7.6% 7, 7 from 2018 to 2019. The numbers, numbers are stable and growing as Colombia keeps gaining momentum in the economy, keeps gaining confidence because of our political and uh, security uh, conditions. Um, the numbers show that the, the, the tourism is, is, is responding well. And um, Netflix and Hollywood, are a challenge, but they do help in a strange and paradoxical way. The shows that they show from Colombia, uh, you know, you might know better what I'm speaking about. Uh, incredibly, they have created tourism in Colombia and interest in Colombia and uh, sort of uh, uh, curiosity tourism that's uh, booming in many of our cities. Of course, we need to give a we need to put, the, put this around and, and, and show that Colombia is much more than what Netflix or Hollywood has, have showed. And we are a country of innovation. We are a, country, a young, vibrant nation. And it's much more than Narcos and much more than what Hollywood has shown. But it's good because it's, 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 it's captivating a new public. So we want to turn it around, nonetheless, accept what's going on. We don't deny our challenges. We don't deny our history but we want to, know, want to show the world the new Colombia, the Colombia of the 21st century. Thank you very much. I, will, I would, uh, would like to end up with this. Uh, in our national day recently, a couple of weeks ago in Ottawa, I said that we are open for business for the creative industry sector. Cirque du Soleil, 
companies that have to do with design, with programming, with the arts, with literature, uh, with new applications, digital applications. We want you in Colombia. We are open for business. And here is my good friend, Mr. Alvaro Concha, our trade officer here in the office of ProColombia in Toronto. He and his team, Marvelous team, would be more than glad to give you more details on how you can establish yourselves in Colombia. And thank you, Andres, for this marvelous opportunity to speak about the country. And I hope this uh, good breakfast has results in investment, in numbers, and in visiting Colombia. Thank you so very much. Great to be here. So a little bit about my background. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. My background is in engineering. I built my first company when I was 21, and still that company is a market leader in a specific niche market. Uh, later I came here to Toronto, got my PhD, and built Blanc Labs a few years ago. Blanc Labs is an innovation powerhouse. What we do, A, we work with large enterprises in their digital transformation and accelerate their growth by helping them uh, building new software solution and digital solution that not only bring revenue but improve customer experience and transform their processes. And secondly, we incubate innovation uh, projects in-house and turn them to product and solutions that makes a difference. And er our area of exp expertise include uh, uh, fintech, including lending solution, other solution for banking, uh, healthcare, when we have uh, products that help save lives, for example, with the can cancer patients and uh, transportation, then we have solution that right now we're working with City of Miami for essentially a, a, what I would call uh, a, a transformation of uh, the, the, public, uh, uh, the, the public transportation and bringing public and private together to improve mobility within the city. And that's a solution that's going kind to of scale level. at some point, hopefully, we bring it to Colombia and Canada and other countries as well. Uh, back to the story of why we went to Colombia and how did it happen. In innovation, in software, the only thing that matters, to be honest, is talent. Like we know, we don't have massive physical assets or massive inventory. It's all about talents. And when we talk talent, we talk about the best and brightest. And we have a firm belief in our company that the best and brightest can be found anywhere in Colombia, in China, in Russia, in Canada. Actually, that's one of the strengths of Canada: is diversity to bring the best and brightest here in Canada. But you need to look beyond Canada. So we decided to look beyond Canada and look for other countries where we can source those best and brightest. Uh, my background in PhD is such international business. I know the important time zone, especially when you want to innovate in an agile fashion. And given the time zone, between North and South America, for us, South America was an ideal location in the sense that it could work around the clock together. So that was the second condition. So we looked uh, in South America for that reason, rather than Ukraine or India or China to build our cross-country uh, and international team. The second criteria for us for political and economic stability, we wanted to move to a country and invest in a country that's politically and economically stable so that we can plan long term. So we looked at a few countries, and there are a handful of countries that you feel like they're politically stable enough that you could plan long term, not just for years, but decades. And in that sense, I'm very pleased that we chose Colombia. At that, at that time, we decided that it's an economic and politically stable country. And now it is still, we still believe that it's, it's for the foreseeable future, it's going to be like a very stable country to invest in. And the third criteria was the talent pool. So Colombia is a relatively large country. We looked at a few countries, relatively large country. At the time, I believe we, uh, our, is, our study showed that there were 340,000 IT professionals, universities in which uh, there was significant investment in the sense that growing that talent pool and get them ready. And the culture was such that, and we looked at Medellin and Bogota, ultimately decided to build our first office in Bogota. But the, the talent pool, uh, after like studying and researching, was such that it felt like they have the necessary background that a bit of training they become about, uh, among the best. Because we, we, are, we have a model that only we have kind of a rocket star engineers. We don't have average people. So we wanted to have people that are really, really strong and with the proper training stand out, not in the nation, but globally speaking, because that's what our clients demands. So Colombia satisfied all the three criteria in the sort of stability, uh, time zone, stable, political and economic stability, and sufficient talent pool. And uh, since then, uh, when we entered Colombia, it was uh, about two years and a half ago. 
Uh, right now we have 30 really top elite engineers in Bogota and the team in Bogota and the team in Toronto as well as our clients and partners, mostly in North America, work around the clock and since then we've been, we've been really happy with the results uh, we got from Colombia. Uh, how to get to the market? We essentially start from scratch. I travel in person, look for the office, meet some of my people and build a good aircraft. So essentially we did it the hard way, not with the right partnership and support and maybe panels like this and relations like this help future companies to build it faster and grow faster if they wish to invest in Colombia or grow within Colombia. So we'll, we'll come to you after the few questions. Yeah. Um, back to Alfredo. Uh, how do you see the future of your respective industries? Where do you see challenges and opportunities um, in, your, in your industry and in Colombia? Um, um, one of the when, when you think about creative economies, this very very specific uh, the, the, the topic, it, it's a pretty big mix of uh, a lot of different, different disciplines. But it's actually the core is probably around uh, it's a core that is around art, uh, entertainment, uh, innovation. Uh, and one of the things that all three have in common is that you usually, for them to be meaningful, you need some sort of uh, friction. Uh, so you need proximity, you need the ability to, to bring people together. So there, there is a cross pollination of ideas and, and, and concepts. And one of the things we're finding is that as we move into more integrated projects, we see a really interesting landscape for us uh, in terms of uh, a company that can bring uh, together both entertainment, the cultural aspects, and, and the more traditional it's called a mixed use component to in traditional, more traditional offices and so on. Uh, we believe that uh, there is an interesting, a very interesting future uh, in trying to figure out new formats where you can actually mix uh, quite a few different program elements into something that is a bit bigger than some of the parts. And uh, um, we believe that those, is, those will result in spaces that are not siloed. I mean, that, that to me would be the biggest challenge. And, and the way the development industry tends to work is, is try to control all the variables in any particular project, and therefore you tend to do retail, you tend to do culture, you tend to do uh, entertainment as almost like separate uh, silos. And, and what we found is that when you actually find a way to break the walls in between the silos, uh, things get much more interesting, they get more creative, you, you, you start finding synergies that uh, are not traditionally, or not apparently at the first glance. So we believe that the biggest opportunity will be in, in how to tap into new models, how to reformat existing models, uh, that, that, uh, and how to repurpose uh, sort of either spaces or, or business models that allow that integration of, of, of uses and functions. And um, specifically in Colombia, uh, there is, um, and I'm using this in the best possible way, it's a bit of an informatic in the way some of these conversations go, that uh, is actually really, really helpful in, in, in helping break these silos and these barriers between disciplines and, and program elements. And so uh, we believe that there is, well, I personally believe that there is a really, really interesting future there, and there is a bit of a challenge in how you actually figure out how to integrate these places. Uh, so they are both uh, fantastic incubators of ideas and creativity, but also become really interesting places for the regular people to visit. I mean, if you do this completely behind the wall, uh, then you're actually missing some of the, the other types of possibilities or, or the engagement with the, with the bigger party. And so if, if we figure a way to do the the two things at the same time, create these creative incubators and make them accessible to the general public, I think it's a fantastic opportunity there. What? That's great. I like what you were talking about, those walls and breaking them down. You know, It makes people a bit uncomfortable to merge those worlds. Um, our industry is going through uh, a massive amount of disruption right now. We all know Netflix, YouTube, all this world of uh, tablets and iPhones, and IoT. It's a world of content right now, and that's my business. We produce content. So it can be exciting, but also challenging. Uh, you have to remain flexible, scalable, 
um, our key partners in broadcasting, they, they're not able to, to manage those changes very effectively. So it's an opportunity for a company like mine to build stronger partnerships um, and for me to position myself as someone that can come in and talk to a Disney or an NBC Universal or a Nickelodeon and tell them that we can offer them a solution to these challenges uh, requires for me to have a lot of resources available. So our, our expansion into Latin America, specifically Colombia, was made with that uh, in mind. Um, we're, we've got, we've focused on five business units right now. We have our service division, which the term service right now, because of this disruption, is being blurred. It's more partnerships that, that they're starting to become. We've got a uh, IP development division where we're creating our own content. Uh, we've got a gaming division. It's, it's a natural extension for content and that's where audiences and eyes need to be. We have a distribution division based out in France to help us with the merchandising, with the licensing, the acquisitions, things like that. Uh, we've also got the, the school that I mentioned to you about. And having these units, which is why I was interesting with you referring to these walls, uh, allows us to play around uh, and, and I guess this concept of design thinking, which makes people very uncomfortable, but that's where people diverge. And it's up to us as leadership to bring them back down and converge again and come up with really cool solutions on how, on how we can tackle uh, these challenges. I mean. Sure, so on my side, um, so when my sector is really technolo technology and technological innovation sector. And in, the, in this sector, if you want to talk about challenge opportunity, on opportunity side, obviously, we are living in the age of disruption. And I say in a positive way, in the sense that more often than not, you have $2 trillion disrupted and then $4 trillion new opportunity arising, essentially. It's an exciting time, both for established enterprises to use tech innovation to grow, as well as for new disruptors and innovators to create new uh, solutions that improve people's lives, but actually create economic prosperity. So there are many opportunities. In the specific sector of uh, you know, product engineering services, that was a sector that was $700 billion per year, now it's growing to about $1.2 trillion. It's a, it's a massive growing sector. Uh, so there are a lot of op global opportunities, as well as opportunity in Colombia. So what you observe in Colombia, the opportunity is that the size of eco economy in innovation and technology is growing fast. So I'll give you one example, and there are many, obviously. So Rappi, a Colombian company, Bogota headquarter. So very recently, they paired with uh, you know, Anderson Horowitz from US, uh, American VCs. I think Anderson initially invested a few million, then 600 million, then SoftBank invested. I think in general, they got about 1 billion investment. And it's a significant amount for a, what looks like a small uh, tech company headquartered in Bogota. Now with that billion, on with that billion dollar and growing in entire South America. Now that's an example of uh, you know tech tech companies that built by Colombian in Colombia and now having a most regional Latin American presence. But from what I've seen in Colombia, from financial in inclusion and a lot of fintech gaps to transportation gaps to healthcare gaps, we could have many of these companies. It could be purely Colombian, like the example of Rappi. But again, the reason why Rappi is Rappi is that it had a partner with non-Colombians as investors, as partners. So we could have many of those things for Canadian companies, for uh, Colombian companies, for partnership essentially, many multi-billion dollar new companies, disruptive companies could emerge. That's opportunities because Colombian market is large and you could even look beyond Colombian market because once you're successful, you could have a presence beyond Colombia and other, at least I would say the Spanish part of Latin America, and maybe hopefully the broader Latin America or Americas. The challenge though is that, uh, and I'm only talking about technology sector and technology innovation sectors because I'm not as versed in other sectors, is that Colombian tech sector is fairly isolated, you know, excluding a few examples here and there. So here in Canada, we're very well integrated with US economy, and I would say, also with global economy, in the tech, in the tech and innovation, we're very well connected. Like usually American VCs, Canadian VCs, they co-invest. On the tech side, you have a lot of relationships. Uh, that's not necessarily true for Colombia. I see more isolation in Colombia. And uh, software and innovation is very scalable. You want to build a solution and invest enough so that solution become the best in the world, or at least in the region. And it, like it's very hard to do that in isolation. So as big as a globe, uh, like a Colombia economy is, let me talk about software innovation, you need to have a broader global horizon 
uh, that require further integration between Colombia and tech sector, and uh, tech sectors in, at least in North America and Canada, I would say. And I would say there should be a lot more that we can do to build that bridge and build that connection. And that's where innovation you know, makes better economic sense. That's where we're gonna have more rapids from Colombia, as well as most Canadian and American companies that do joint venture or do business together and then create real, real value. The second challenge is that right now in the tech innovation, uh, Colombian economy, I hate to use the term, but is a bit more of a safe copycat player in the sense that you have Uber, you copy Uber, you become Rappi. Nothing wrong about that. It's just a $1 billion company. But I think at some point they need to move from copycat because Colombia and Latin America itself has very unique challenges. So it means that they could be very, very creative and innovative solutions that look at the problems in a different way and come up with different solutions. And that could give Colombian economy an edge in the sense that building new native solutions that doesn't exist anywhere else and have the confidence to take it beyond Colombia. And I haven't seen enough of that within Colombia tech innovation sector. And again, very feasible in my opinion. Interesting. Uh, just a side comment. Uh, I, I saw for many years that uh, North American companies or national companies would look to establish a beachhead in Latin America and they, they would almost invariably think of Chile, mm -hmm. my hometown. But because when you look at the country, stability, economics, you think, uh, maybe we got to go to the safest you know, place. But now, Colombia's becoming part of the conversation. It's interesting. And I think it, for North America, it's actually easier to get to you know, travel times, uh, flights are great. So mm -hmm. Colombia's becoming part of that discussion, which is great. Um, the last question for the three panelists, and we'll jump to EDC. Uh, if you could improve one thing in your country, um, in your industry, sorry, if you could improve one thing in, in your industry, what, what would that be, and what would you improve in Colombia to make you more successful? I think you've touched upon it. Yeah, I think I started to touch a little bit on what I feel needs to happen, on, 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 on what I would see in my side of things. <laughs> it's more about the physical manifestation of some of these forces come together. And it is precisely that, it's, it's both developing a model that uh, allows you to integrate these functions uh, in, 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 in both have a, an environment that allows the interaction between different professionals that we might not have otherwise meet and create sort of new ideas in industries, and then how you expose that to the public and you involve the public into that process. And, and to me that's interesting because uh, you have a whole makers uh, market or, or sector right now that is becoming incredibly empowered by technology. And that actually is giving rise to almost market production, uh, which traditionally will go to industrial zones. Uh, but the public could actually very easily be in touch with that and be part of the production process. So in a way, finding somehow a meeting ground where you could have an scalable spatial solution where you, you meet, uh, you can bring together both public uh, uh, sort of producers, makers, uh, and co creators, uh, to me that becomes a very, very interesting model that, that starts to speak to a, a very different way to do things and, and look at things. Uh, so it, in a way, it's how you, you will position uh, both, uh, I mean, when we were starting with Andres about this, uh, I was, I mean, when we were discussing this idea of what, what you have a creative economy, so therefore you might need a, so you have the orange economy, you might need also an orange infrastructure to make that, that economy sort of bring, bring forward. And part of that infrastructure has to do with regulation, support by the government, a, a, and, and investment, but then there is a manifestation of the, that infrastructure where it becomes the fiscal space where, where this meets. And to me, from the urban design point of view, that's the best possible scenario where you have a, a city that is responding to this in a very dynamic way and is creating the, both the institutions on one side and the public spaces and the private spaces that respond to these, these, these pushes and these, these interests. To me, that, that becomes kind of the, the, the kind of place that I would love to be able to involve in, in bringing forward uh, because uh, um, that starts to be that, that meeting ground. And cities are, 
human beings, it's about, <laughs> it's about relationships, it's about that spark that happens when, when people meet and discuss ideas. And so figuring out the, 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 the right environment for that, that, that to me would be the biggest innovation you can probably come from, from my side. <laughs> Very good. Uh, for us, I mean, when, when I look at our industry and the impact it has on our economy, um, the creative cluster specifically, animation, VFX, gaming, it's the, it's the leading growth industry for Ontario's GDP, for Canada's GDP, it's outpacing forestry, mining, energy, it's approaching financial services, manufacturing, and to have a challenge such as uh, not finding enough talent. You know, we work with all the major schools and they just can't keep up. They can't even open up space for international students, which is a great business model for them, one that we're a part of. That's, that's something we need to, to tackle. And I think we're dependent on international relationships so that the component of accessing international talent should have a better uh, focal point. Uh, what we're trying to do in Colombia, it hasn't been easy to bring people here or send people there. Like it's, it's still not as seamless as it should be. And then that's a, a challenge that we have. Not just access to talent uh, for production as well, but like you were saying a little bit, especially in Colombia, we also have offices in Chile. Um, we're in need of talent wherever we can get it. And we're looking for, we have a specific program where we can develop this talent. But it hasn't been easy to navigate and, and, and standardize our process with Canada. So I think that's something that needs to be improved on. But also the component of creating a new market for us. You know, these are Canadian standards. We're on the, on the global stage of this technology, of all about it, you know, in terms of creating content. So if we go to a market like Colombia or Chile, where they're open to learning, we're standardizing, we're creating a content culture that is completely aligned with Canadian values. That's, that's a huge opportunity, and I don't think that's being properly uh, managed. Yes, absolutely. So uh, in technology and innovation sector, from my perspective, one thing that we can change is the bridge between the strengths of the bridge between Colombian economy, in, I'm talking about tech innovation only, and Canadian economy. I think we can build much stronger bridge that benefit both economies in the sense that more partnership, more affiliations, even more co-investment. Like uh, Colombia has a very, I would say, young, emerging uh, venture capital investment sector for technology, really, really compared to Canada. Canada is about a lot more established. Uh, but again, they invest in isolation, right? And it's not good to invest in isolation. You need to co-invest with bigger VCs, Canadian. And Canadian often do that with American, so that you have greater capital strengths, greater expertise. On the tech sector as well, we need that kind of bridging between the tech sector in Colombia and tech sector in Canada. I think it has not, it not enough has been done to build that bridge. I don't think even we have like a couple of like real events in Toronto or in Bogota to bring both economies together. Uh, last year, around the same time, we hosted an event in Colombia in which uh, like we invited, we, we were not the only one, we were part of a group essentially. Some Canadian, like Colombian VCs, Colombian family offices, Colombian tech companies, and we present as well. And it was huge potential. But beyond that, there is not enough of those bridging, bridging thing. And I think uh, like groups like this can do a lot more in bringing two parts together because there's got to be significant potential for value creation once we connect them further at the company level at the, at the industry level. Okay, we will now. Uh I move to Anthony from the EDC. Thank you for patiently waiting. No problem. <laughs> the first question for you is uh, how can the EDC help Canadian companies interested in expanding to Columbia or other markets? Okay, now before I get into that, I'd like to say thank you uh, for having us and we're proud to support this event. Um, I also want to give a brief description of EDC. So, uh, Export Development Canada is a Canadian crown corporation with a mandate to help Canadian companies go, grow, and succeed outside of Canada. Um, we do that primarily. Actually, before I jump into that, I also want to mention I'm part of a new uh, technology industry team within the GTA at EDC. And we created this team because there are uh, unique challenges to companies in the technology, media, and life sciences space. And we want to make sure that we're properly understanding those and giving them the uh, right support. And we actually saw over a third of the companies, uh, new clients that we acquired last year were actually in this space. So we're seeing strong growth. Um, 
Now, the way that we do help Canadian companies that are looking to sell outside of Canada or already is um, a few buckets. Uh, one, we make sure that you get paid uh, when selling outside of Canada, both for goods and services. Uh, and we do a lot of the technology and media companies don't really view themselves as exporters because they're not shipping a physical product over borders. But as long as you are earning revenues from outside of Canada, we classify that as an export. Um, and then we also, so we make sure you get paid by providing account receivable insurance. And we can do that for uh, software companies as well with mo uh, monthly recurring revenue models. Uh, we also can provide the contract cancellation coverage. So if you're a manufacturer or a service provider where you have uh, costs upfront before you get paid, or before you ship the product or deliver the service, we can cover that as well. Uh, and we're very flexible. We can do uh, single buyer, multiple buyer, your full book of business. And it has the added benefits of allowing you to be more proactive and more aggressive with the payment terms that you're offering internationally. And let us take on that risk because we don't want you to turn down opportunities because one of your clients is insisting on payment terms that you're not comfortable with. And it also has the added benefit of um, giving your Canadian bank more comfort to lend to you because your receivables are insured. Uh, additionally, another working capital solution that we provide is we have our export guarantee program. And this is where we are providing a guarantee to Canadian financial institutions to back up a portion of their loan to a Canadian exporting company. Uh, and that's there to act as a security enhancement, give them more risk appetite to lend more to these companies or earlier to these companies uh, to help them kind of go and take on the world. Um, this can be used for general purpose working capital operating lines. Uh, it can be used for machinery and equipment. It can be used for acquisitions. And it can also be used for supporting assets outside of Canada. So working capital for a foreign subsidiary or a foreign acquisition, we can support that. Um, if you have a hardware component to your company and you actually have inventory that you need to have in a foreign country so that you can get it to your clients quickly, we can uh, guarantee that as well so that your Canadian bank can lend against it like we're sitting in Canada. Um, and then we also can guarantee uh, standby letters of credit that a bank might issue on your behalf. Uh, what we see the most in the creative industries is actually landlord lease bonds, so, uh, especially if you're opening up a new office uh, in a foreign country, you don't have a track record there uh, that the landlord can get comfortable with. So we're seeing, uh, and this happens domestically as well, but we're seeing landlords require uh, up to six months, but up to a year in some cases of rent being held as collateral. Uh, and so you can have the option of either giving that to your landlord to hold in cash, or you can get your bank to issue a standby letter of credit on your behalf. Unfortunately, they're going to hold the same amount as collateral and cash or carpet of an offering line. We can guarantee that 100% as well. And then uh, we also actually do buyer financing. Uh, it's something that we haven't done as much in the software tech uh, media space, but it is something we're looking to explore in the future. And we actually have our partner uh, over there uh, from Elevate Export Finance, who uh, we partner with on those. Then. Lastly, we uh, provide knowledge and connections related to exporting. So uh, knowledge would be, we have an export help team based in Ottawa. If you have any uh, questions, whether it's on Canada's free trade agreements that we have in place, uh, general information on doing business in a new country, the tax legal implications, we can source that information for free. Uh, and then connections, we work closely with both uh, private and public partners that might be able to assist you as you go outside of Canada. So I know we also have the Trade Commissioner Service here. We work very closely with them, both domestically and abroad. And then the Business Development Bank of Canada is another Canadian Crown Corporation uh, that we work closely with. I, I mean, Andy, touched a little bit on this, but uh, could you tell us more about the strengths that Canada has in the innovative and creative industries and what type of Canadian companies are you currently working with? Uh, yeah, so before I get into the company, so I'll say kind of, I think what is uh, feeding into our strong tech industry uh, ecosystem. And first of all, I think we have a vibrant uh, venture capital community. So I know 
In 2018, I believe Canadian companies raised $3.5 billion in BC, um, and that's a 30% increase in the volume, or sorry, 35% increase in the volume, 30% increase in the number of deals, so the average deal size is getting bigger as well. Uh, I work very closely with the banks uh, in helping them support technology, media, creative companies, and we are seeing them more aggressive than ever in this space. Uh, something that wouldn't have been the case, uh, like one bank was in there 10 years ago, now pretty much all of them are buying for uh, this market share. And we're also seeing a lot more uh, corporate uh, corporations that are involved in equity raises as well. So they're looking to Canadian tech companies to uh, help them kind of uh, bring their business model into the 21st century. So uh, altogether, for strong companies, strong ideas, there's an abundance of capital, and I think that is contributing to the growth that we're seeing in this space in Canada. Uh, obviously, the proximity to the US helps as well. Uh, it's a very uh, similar culture to us, not identical, but uh, having access to the money there as well uh, does help. And then the labor force. I know there is a shortage and pretty much every company that I talk to is always struggling to find talent. But with that said, we do have a lot of good talent, but there's just a lot of companies that are competing for it. Um, I believe that between 2012 and 2017, Canada added more tech jobs than any city in North America. Uh, sorry, Toronto added it uh, more than any city in North America. Um, and while it sounds like you've had some issues with uh, immigration and bringing new talent into Canada, I think we are still uh, in a better position than our neighbors south of the border in that regard. So um, that has helped as well. And then I think we've got good government support. So we've got R&D tax credits, uh, digital media tax credits, um, government grants that you can use to uh, not just grow your company domestically, but abroad as well. So. Um, as for the companies that we're seeing, I would say still the majority of companies that I see are in the software uh, as a service, particularly enterprise uh, SaaS is the largest. Uh, I know Toronto does have a, a very vibrant AI community as well. Uh, we have the University of Toronto that's doing great things with um, a professor that's considered the godfather of deep learning. You know, the Vector Institute that was uh, recently created to support research and development in this space. Uh, we see a ton in the like health and med tech as well. Um, media, both traditional and digital, as you mentioned, uh, production is massive in Canada, in which we have the lower Canadian dollar and the talent and the programs to support it. Um, so we're actually working with a lot of companies in that space as well. And we're actually we're helping banks get comfortable with their exposure to these streaming platforms where they're financing productions all around the world. Uh, and they're now starting to take another look and say, hey, we might need your help. Uh, so we also do like animation video games and uh, blockchain is a tough one to get involved in, but we see a lot of companies in that spot. Um, if they are like an enterprise solution, we can help, but if they're touching crypto at this point, it's hands off. So. <laughs> and the last uh, question for you, what actions do you recommend that company should take when deciding to go to other markets, maybe Colombia, and what type of challenges do they typically face? Okay. Um, so the first thing I would say is put together a plan because if you're looking to enter a new market with like one-off sales here and there, that's very different than actually establishing a presence and growing market share. If you're looking to actually establish a presence, then we would recommend that you kind of make a commitment up front for both time and money uh, to be there for the long haul. Uh, it's important to both uh, have support on the ground in that country so that you can build rapport with your clients um, and just develop a knowledge of the local culture. Um, now, I would say if you don't have a strong understanding of the local culture already, 
then it's important to enter into strate uh, strategic alliances maybe or start joint ventures. Uh, coming from my, the finance world, just if you're looking to finance a foreign joint venture, just be cognizant that if you own less than 50% or preferably 51%, uh, it's very hard to do that from Canada because you do not have uh, control of the assets or the decision making of that foreign company. Um, I would also say make sure you are engaging with the government resources that are available. So Export Development Canada, we help with basically risk mitigation, working capital, knowledge and connections. The Trade Commissioner Service can help with uh, introductions to foreign buyers and help ease your entry into new markets. With that said, I would advise that when you engage with the Trade Commissioner Service, um, make sure that you've kind of done your homework, you have a plan, show them that you're serious. Um, don't look to them to be your foreign sales team, business development team. They're there more so to facilitate your team on the ground. And if you go with, to them with a couple of companies that you would like introductions to, they'll see what they can do and hopefully make it happen. Um, but yeah, be very cognizant that you need to kind of bring some legwork to it as well. Uh, business development Bank of Canada can also help with domestic financing and long-term patient capital as well. And I would say uh, make sure you're talking to qualified experts both on uh, foreign tax and immigration. So have a good uh, accountant and lawyer that is comfortable with the jurisdiction or has a network that they work closely with other uh, partners. And lastly, be culturally aware, I touched on that to begin with. Um, just make sure you know the nuances of the local culture. And one of the things that I actually saw on our website for Columbia is that be mindful that uh, there are parts of the society that are still conservative, but that dress sharp if you're doing business in Columbia <laughs> because uh, everyone there is or most people there are highly uh, with it, with fashion, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great way to end the panel. Uh, I personally travel to Colombia very regularly now, um, and my favorite is Cartagena. Uh, you know, honeymoon capital of, the, of South America. It's a Beautiful. fantastic place. So that's, uh, so that's the end of the formal panel uh, discussion. Why don't we turn it over to questions uh, from the audience uh, for about five, ten minutes, uh, and then we can wrap up and have an informal chat. Any, any questions? Why don't I kick it off then? Uh, there are questions at some point. Uh, Hamid, uh, when talking about AI and blockchain, at what stage do you see Colombia? And what is needed to see uh, the industry growing, as in Canada, for example? Uh, yes, I think that's a very good and a specific question. So first, I'm really proud of where, where Canada is standing in these emerging technologies. As you've mentioned, uh, Canada and University of Toronto in specific is considered a truly a godfather of deep learning, as we know. In blockchain, uh, we have uh, people like Vitaly Boutik and Anton Deleri who co-founded Ethereum, which is definitely by far the largest blockchain in the world and most regarded one. We have other blockchains like AI and built here. So generally speaking, many like emergent technology like uh, IoT, but particularly blockchain and AI, Canada, given its size, it's, it's phenomenal. Like it's essentially one of the leaders, if not the leader in the world. Mm -hmm. Colombia, uh, we've seen, as the ambassador mentioned, we've seen investment, especially in Medellin, but also broader Colombia, and interest in blockchain, in IoT, in AI. But there's a bit of a catch-up game, I think, that need to be played a bit faster when you talk to, like, more important underlying technology, investment underlying technology, more being, being people being trained. And I know this because hands-on, I work with, you know, Bogota engineer, Colombian engineer, and we train them on AI, on machine learning, on data and sciences. So we see a gap from the raw talent we see in Colombia versus what we see from people from so Toronto and Waterloo. So I think in this important enabling technology, like there need to be a bit more investment and a net push. More importantly, this enabling technology at the end, technology is technology. It matters because you solve certain problem with it. It comes back to what kind of use cases they solve that create economic prosperity, right? 
So in, uh, in February, I was speaking at the World Economic Forum, the, fourth, the Center for Fourth Industrial Revolution. And uh, I was representing, I was presenting Velocity Essential Solution we built, and we had other groups from around the world presenting. I didn't see anyone from Colombia. Meaning that again, when you look at the edge, cutting edge, that people use these emerging technologies and solve a new problem in a different way, in an innovative way. There was none, at least in that specific meeting of World Economic, there was none. So not only I think in Colombia, we need to, like the Colombian and maybe like collaboratively, not Colombia. Again, the problem is that it should not be Colombia alone. It should be like a bridge. Like we all talk about there, invest further in enabling technologies, but also use them to solve new problems in novel ways. We need both of those things for Colombian economy to stand out and play a leading role like Canada in emerging technologies. And that's where like you see significant economic prosperity. That's where you build new multi-billion dollar companies, essentially, which is good for economy, which is good for job creations, and it's good for trade better countries. Uh, for, question, for Fatima, uh, Fatima, you have a question? For Fredo, does the creative economy require a creative infrastructure? And you touched on it. Yeah, I touched a little bit on that. Uh, yeah, I think it does. And I think uh, it has to, it has to, there has to be a network that is not just creating or, or reusing old models. There has to be a real deep thinking about how these spaces are different and how they achieve different benefits than the previous ones. Uh, part of the problem is that if we look at the creative, the, the, kind of the cultural creation and site, the creative economy, uh, there sometimes is a a mismatch between thinking that culture is free uh, versus the access to culture. <coughs> so the production of culture has to be rewarded. You, you cannot have a, a cultural industry that relies on free will of its producers. I mean, those people are doing it for a living, they, they need to figure out a way to make a living out of it. So, uh, but the access to culture, that could be a very interesting uh, in, a, in a very different way to, to achieve uh, that. Uh, one model that I, I really like is, is a bit of what uh, Artscape does in front. Uh, it's a really interesting organization that actually results in tangible spaces that connect the community and where active artists are, are exposed to these communities. And then it evolves beyond that. I mean, you go to which farms and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a farmer's market happening at the same time that you have the studios for the, for the artists. Um, the distillery district actually got kick-started by, by Artscape. There was no way the distillery would have got where it is right now if Artscape had not been part of the original mix. And the developers do that really well. They actually put Artscape there with the idea of driving traffic into the, uh, into the, 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 the environment. What, what I envision is that multiply by five. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I mean, if you want to be about technology disruption, you have to tend four things before they actually have an impact. And, and, and Artscape is a fantastic organization. It's very much about artists. Uh, and that's their ethos of what they do. They do it really well. Uh, I think uh, uh, if you expand that uh, and you start creating environments where you have that as one of the main components, you actually can multiply that impact and that effect by, by ten four. Question here? Yeah. I'm wondering if panelists have any insights into programs or collaborations going on in the medical or healthcare space between Colombia and Canada. There's been very little comment or hardly any uh, comment on those sectors. Yeah, the question was about collaboration in the healthcare in the space. I'm not familiar with any, but I can have our, if you want to connect after, I can definitely look into it. So I'm also not familiar with any, but we have a client called Medex, which is a public Canadian company that has a product that helps with preventing, like essentially early diagnosis of skin cancer. And they have some presence in Mexico, Spain, and other countries. I'm not sure if they're connected in Colombia. I can connect you if, you, if it helps. We should have a, a panelist covering that. <laughs> uh, we've got just a moment for, uh, do you have one final question, uh, Juan? How do you see the animation industry in Colombia and what is required to put it on the global stage as you have done with your team? Uh, well, it's, a, it's, 
it's a very vibrant culture with a lot of history, very colorful. Uh, they're incredibly educated, uh, which are basis for content. So I think there's a great opportunity for them to explore in collaboration with Canada and upgrading their production values and processes to be able to tell these stories in, in, in a better way, uh, in a more global way. Uh, it goes beyond you know, the, the narcos of the world and, and things like that. There's actually a lot of content, even in Chile and in Latin America in general, that the world will be very receptive to. So we're working with them on helping them kind of package their, their content a lot better. And uh, I see a bright future for them. That's why we're there. We're, we're acquiring a lot of talent. We're acquiring companies, studios, software companies that are in asset management, digital, digital asset management, things like that. So I think it's a bright future. It's just a matter of opportunity. You know, there's talent. There's just no opportunity to give them consistency, to co constantly uh, have them accessing the latest technology, the advanced processes. They, they don't see that on a regular basis. So we're trying, we're trying to bridge that gap. Well, this is one final question. I think uh, we're going to wrap up. And I'm just going to say a couple of final words. Thank you to the panelists. Well, thank you very much for hosting the event, for moderating the event, and perfect timing, I guess, to be there. So, good luck. Thanks. Also, uh, Ambassador, thank you for, for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I truly love uh, the sector that you, you presented today. And, we as a channel, we want to support them. I uh, don't think that it is you know, solar, the tourism of course, the orange economy. We definitely want to continue. And with your permission, we want to share the presentation with your audience. Excellent, course. thank you. Uh, as well, panelists are amazing. Thank you, I mean, good friends, all of you. And I uh, look forward to having you again. This is going to be a conversation that we're going to continue. Hopefully, uh, everybody understands that this is, uh, this we have to do it together. Um, the experiences that the panel had just gonna help us to learn how we're gonna do it together as well. Um, I think when we talk about challenges, it's as well an opportunity for everybody here to help. So thank you and this message for everybody. Look forward to seeing you in Colombia. If you need any help, I think there's enough resources we talked about today. We have EAC, Government Affairs, Canada, we have for Colombia, um, FASCIN, the Chamber, Ontario. There are many options for everybody to, to start. So, I uh, want to work with you and I look forward to seeing you very soon in your summer and thank you for, for coming.